uh, thought what I would like to do today is kind of set the scene for uh, what the U.S. energy situation uh, and the world situation might look like uh, out to the year 2040. That's a long time away. Uh, I keep telling people that ask me about the value of forecasts that go to the year uh, 2040. Uh, you, one thing you can be absolutely sure of, it'll be wrong. Question is, and why would you do it? And the answer is that you take a reference case and then you can run side cases against that reference case and look at the changes. And it's the changes between the reference case and the side cases that give you insight into the kinds of questions that policymakers, like the governor, uh, have to struggle with. So let me just quickly go over these things. Uh, I'm going to try to do this. You know, there's been a lot of scientific research that shows it says that uh, people can understand slides in about seven seconds. Now, I'm not going to quite test the seven-second rule, uh, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, a little bit more on this first one. Uh, first slide basically says uh, the key results. The United States uh, has a really good chance of becoming a net energy, so not just oil and natural gas and coal, uh, oil products, but total energy exporter uh, sometime before the year 2030. In fact, most of the heavy lifting is done early in the next decade. So if I had to lean one way or the other on this, I would say that it would happen uh, sometime early in the 2020s. Uh, very strong growth in domestic production, uh, like the Bakken, the Eagle Ford, the Niobrara, uh, and other uh, big shale formations. On the oil side, uh, on the natural gas side, the Marcellus is now uh, probably uh, the, the second largest producing uh, field. It will shortly be the largest uh, in Pennsylvania. That's where I grew up. And uh, Pennsylvania thought the heyday of the oil and gas industry was the 18th 60s and 70s, uh, and not uh, the current decade, it's changed. Uh, we will be a net exporter of natural gas uh, in 2017 in the form of both LNG, liquefied natural gas, and pipeline exports uh, to Mexico. Uh, U.S. energy consumption, so use, is going to grow fairly slowly uh, through a combination of, of uh, reduced energy intensity, uh, including uh, things like fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. Renewables will uh, be growing the fastest among all of the energy uh, sources, uh, but uh, from a relatively low base, uh, currently providing something like 8% uh, of uh, U.S. energy growing uh, out uh, to be perhaps twice that by the year 2040. Uh, lots of growth in wind and, and solar, and I'll show you that. And then finally, improved efficiency and consumption in the energy and use sectors uh, basically stabilizes U.S. carbon dioxide uh, output. The governor talked about uh, climate change, greenhouse gases, and carbon uh, from fossil fuel burning. And what we find is that U.S. carbon emissions, uh, energy-related, uh, will never uh, we think, exceed the levels that were reached in 2005, 6, and 7. So this is actually fairly interesting. All right, now we're going to try this uh, quick uh, view of these slides. What this uh, particular uh, slide here shows is one of the few comparisons between last year's uh, energy outlook and this year's. And uh, what we are starting off with is much lower oil prices. So we begin with oil prices that are well below that $80 line that you see there. Uh, eventually moving up over time to get back to a level of about $150 a barrel in the year 2040 as we had last year, uh, but uh, starting from a much lower base. Uh, this is that graphic uh, that I was showing you in terms of total U.S. energy consumption. Uh, you can uh, see uh, that uh, petroleum is actually going down a little bit, natural gas rising, uh, coal uh, holding its uh, own in terms of market share uh, along with uh, nuclear, uh, but uh, renewables um, in growing. One of the things to keep in mind uh, is that um, renewables uh, and, and coal uh, could have a very different outcome uh, in the, the uh, EPA clean power 
um, rule that's uh, under consideration uh, right now. Uh, what we use is existing law and regulation. If the EPA actually agrees to change this, it's gonna, those numbers will move around. Uh, what you see here is the net energy import number. In uh, at least two of our cases, including the reference case, the U.S. does become a net uh, energy exporter uh, sometime uh, in the period around 2030. But as I said uh, earlier, a lot of that drop happens uh, fairly early between now and, and uh, the 2020s. In the high oil price case and the high oil and gas resource case, so higher oil and gas production in both those cases, uh, it happens uh, even sooner and the U.S. becomes a net exporter. Uh, this is the graphic on uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And what you see is that uh, even in the high economic growth case, so uh, the economy growing at well over the 2.4% per year that we use in the reference case, uh, numbers approaching 3% uh, per year growth, uh, that carbon dioxide emissions do grow in that case, uh, but we still remain below that uh, peak reached back in 2005-07. Uh, uh, the best performing uh, in our uh, cases uh, from carbon dioxide standpoint is a low economic growth case, but that's not the way we want to do that. Good, you're paying attention. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the best way uh, to deal with that is to look for ways to improve uh, the kinds of fuels that we use uh, and maybe even to, um, to have breakthroughs in technology like battery and solar and possibly uh, things uh, even like carbon sequestration. All right, let's take a look at some of the uh, oil issues. Uh, oil prices started dropping last uh, summer. Uh, there were several things that were going on even before the OPEC meeting in November, and what happened last summer is the uh, dollar started to rally, and commodities, including oil that are priced in dollars, uh, often uh, go up when the dollar rallies. Uh, we had a... Um, um, go down rather. So the dollar rallied and oil prices went down, also driving oil prices down. And interesting for a Asia Montana Energy Summit is it was the beginnings of the news that China's economy was slowing down. So a slowdown in the China economy uh, that became evident in the summer of 2014 helped to drive oil prices down as, long, as well as supplies coming from Libya. Libya made a surprise recovery in its uh, oil production activities in that summer. Uh, we had other things that were going on. Uh, finally, the November OPEC meeting when Saudi Arabia said, well, they would deal with things, uh, but they weren't going to deal with it alone. Um, you know, we often, people that uh, get involved in energy often think, and think of uh, oil prices, you know, moderately or moderately high oil prices as being something good. It's good for producers. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that with lower oil prices and the drop in prices that we've seen, the average U.S. household is going to save something like $700 or $750 in the year 2015 because of lower fuel costs. A lot of that uh, lower gasoline costs, uh, but uh, in the Northeast where uh, people use oil for home heating, uh, we'll see a drop in, in household spent expenditures there and things like propane uh, in uh, the West and Midwest. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like you to keep in mind when you think about uh, issues uh, like forecasts for oil prices is there's a lot of variability, a lot of variation in oil uh, and natural gas prices as well. And what this slide shows with those dotted lines is that uh, the options market, so the options market for uh, crude oil and products can be used as a, in a way to calculate uh, what the volatility is around the base number in uh, the futures curve for um, NYMEX WTI, West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil. And one of the things that that shows is that there's a huge uh, variability out to um, uh, you know, early 2016. Uh, what that graph shows is prices could be as low as $30 and, and as high as $100 or maybe even a little bit over $100. And uh, we had a similar set of wings back in the summer of 2014 that said prices might get as low as 60. They actually went a little bit below that. Uh, what that is uh, a way of saying is, is that the people in the futures and options markets, like airlines, Southwest Airlines, a big uh, buyer of jet fuel, uh, uses the futures market to try to hedge 
uh, in the same way that farmers use the futures market to hedge um, things like wheat and corn prices. Uh, the, uh, and refiners all saying that the possibility that prices are going to be a lot higher or lower uh, than we've seen are real. Why? Uh, this is, a, I kind of think of this, if any of you have ever been to a presentation by a, a, uh, an oil or natural gas or any company actually when they make presentations to analysts, they have a page, a disclaimer page that has a lots of fine print that says all of the reasons why forward projections are likely, you know, to, might not be right. And if you want to think about why oil prices could go up or could go down, here is a disclaimer page that says that, that uh, the economy might surprise you to the upside or the downside, that Iraq production might uh, um, get cut off by the, the turbulence there in ISIS, uh, that the sanctions on Iran uh, may come off as part of this nuclear uh, deal that's being um, uh, uh, discussed in Switzerland, uh, if it doesn't come off, the sanctions could get tougher and that could send oil prices up. Or if it does come off, the Iranians might put a million barrels a day of oil on the market uh, and bring oil prices down. Lots of reasons and that's what's behind that variation in the curve. Um, one of the things that we do is we explore in these side cases the effects of very high oil prices and lower oil prices uh, to see the, what that does uh, to the different uh, supply of fuels. Uh, the reference case uh, and the high oil and gas resource case, uh, not too far different, and those two, I think, actually are the most likely. If you look at what that could mean to oil production alone, in the high oil and gas resource case, oil production could just keep climbing from where it is, getting up close to 17, maybe even 18 million barrels a day uh, towards the end of this time frame. Uh, if we have a low oil price environment, and our low oil price environment was in the range of, of uh, 60 to $70 over the next 20, 25 years. Uh, we might actually see crude oil production in the U.S. peaking fairly soon and then uh, tailing off over time. So what's going to happen to that oil price is going to be very important to the overall uh, fuel production outlook. Uh, the same thing is true for exports. Uh, there have been a lot of questions raised recently about whether the U.S. should allow exports of crude oil. Uh, exports of products like gasoline, uh, heating oil, jet fuel, and so on are allowed under U.S. rules, uh, but crude oil is constrained. Uh, significant exports are allowed to Canada, uh, but not too much to the rest of the world. Uh, in our high oil and gas resource case, product exports take off because with all that crude oil production and the uh, export restrictions still in place, the only way to get rid of that oil is through exporting products. Uh, in the low oil price case, uh, you don't have uh, the same kind of constraints. In fact, in the low oil price case, uh, it's not clear that the U.S. would be exporting uh, much crude oil uh, at all. Uh, one of the other things that you see here in terms of overall liquids uh, production, fairly flat. A lot of that has to do with uh, efficiency standards for automobiles. And what you see there in that uh, dark uh, ink at the, the top of the graphic is our net petroleum uh, imports shrinking tremendously. Uh, the widest amount of, uh, of that ink that you see was in 2005. We were importing something like 60% of our oil consumption. Uh, we're now down to um, uh, about 30%. And uh, our forecast is that by 2020, it uh, will be down to below 15 percent. You know, with uh, continuing growth in production, uh, it could even be lower than that. Uh, this shows the, the net imports uh, numbers across the various cases. And then you can see in the high oil price case, and the high oil and gas resource case, uh, that uh, U.S. Uh, becomes a huge uh, exporter of oil. Um, in the transportation area itself, uh, motor gasoline is shrinking. Diesel continues to grow, mainly because with economic and population growth, uh, there's still a lot of goods moving around by truck on the nation's highways. And uh, so diesel uh, use uh, grows considerably. Jet fuel goes up because of uh, jet transportation. Uh, if you think about uh, this from a global standpoint, the U.S. is growing. Uh, Canada's uh, crude oil production is growing. Uh, we do believe that with energy reform that we'll see growth in Mexico. Uh, the other big producers uh, like Russia uh, and, uh, and even Brazil, uh, we would also expect to see growth 
the U.S. numbers um, have actually, in terms of the change uh, from uh, 2010 to 2025 here, uh, the U.S. is the world's strongest petroleum grower. Um, on the demand side, almost all of the demand growth in, in uh, energy uh, and oil is occurring in the developing world. So again, why uh, is uh, Asia important to Montana? If you're going to try to understand Montana's role in the United States, you have to understand the U.S. role in the world and Asia's role, uh, the growth in energy consumption and petroleum consumption outside of the United States and Europe uh, and elsewhere is going to be stunning. It's very important to know that. Um, the uh, uh, thinking about um, you know where uh, a lot of this uh, is going to take place, what you see is uh, Asia uh, as the big grower. So let's uh, do a very quick run through on natural gas. That shows that same kind of volatility in the natural gas price outlook as you saw in oil. Uh, prices could go down uh, below $2 a million BTU and maybe stay there for a while, or maybe they're going to go up uh, as high as 5 or $6 a million BTU. And this is not EIA's forecast. I want to remind you, this is an EIA trying to predict that volatility. This is the options and futures market itself, the prices being used to calculate what the implied volatility is. And this is real transactions uh, from real players in those markets saying, uh, that the outlook uh, is, uh, is a difficult one uh, to watch. Uh, in the near term, we've got plenty of natural gas in storage. We've recovered from the low natural gas storage uh, late last year. Uh, and with all of the growth in production in places like the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, the Utica in Ohio, and continuing production in Texas and Louisiana, Oklahoma, we're going to see, I think, uh, fairly... Um, uh, moderate natural gas pricing outlook. Uh, we do look at uh, high and, and low cases in natural gas as well as oil prices to try to cover that. And the results of all of these side cases are in the full document, the annual energy outlook that's on EIA's website. Uh, in our reference case, natural gas production continues to grow very strongly. This is different than oil. Oil actually goes up and then kind of plateaus out. Uh, natural gas just keeps growing because we think the resource base in natural gas uh, is significant enough uh, that the U.S. can just keep producing this and producing it and producing it. Finding ways to use that is very important. A lot of it is going to go into electric utilities. A lot of it will go into the industrial uh, sector. Um, within the industrial sector, uh, food, chemicals, and refining are some of the big areas uh, of natural gas use. It's making the U.S. very competitive in the international markets. Uh, that uh, natural gas availability uh, for uh, the chemicals industry, metal smelting, um, and even food processing is very, very important. Uh, we show different uh, outlooks uh, for U.S. natural gas exports. Uh, under uh, different cases, uh, the low oil price case, we don't get many more LNG facilities built than the ones that are already under construction. Uh, in the high oil and gas resource case, uh, U.S. Uh, exports of natural gas are likely uh, to continue. Uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, and uh, Chairman Bay here are the, the FERC is the lead agency uh, in uh, doing licensing for LNG uh, exports. The Department of Energy Office of Fossil Energy has something called the National Interest Finding. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, the, there is very little queue, actually. Uh, the, the, at the Department of Energy, all of the projects that have been approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission have been also approved for a national interest finding. I'm going to end up on some very quick slides on uh, electricity. Electricity growth is really slowing. You look at this graph, back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, electricity used to grow every year faster than GDP. During the 1990s and early part of the, the last decade, uh, it grew in line with GDP, but then it started really slowing down. Now we have GDP, as I said, growing like 2.5% uh, and electricity demand growing at less than 1%. It makes for a really interesting problem. Uh, all of that solar and wind that we're getting uh, coming on has got to compete against baseload natural gas, coal, and nuclear 
and it's a very hard thing to do, actually. Uh, we do have re uh, renewables, uh, I think I said earlier, we had renewables uh, in the electricity area growing from about 13% of our electricity generation now uh, to uh, uh, probably close to 20% by the year 2040. Uh, nuclear's share uh, of generation comes off a little bit, coal's comes off a little bit, natural gas goes up. Uh, if the EPA clean power plan goes into effect, uh, what I think you would see here is about the same amount of nuclear, uh, uh, significantly less coal and more renewables and natural gas. Uh, even in our reference case, renewables are growing very strongly. Uh, the, uh, by the time we get to the end of our forecast period, wind uh, will actually exceed uh, conventional hydroelectricity uh, for the first time uh, ever. Uh, if I had to guess what might be wrong on this slide is that breakthroughs in technology uh, on the solar side will grow that solar wedge faster than we're showing here. Uh, both uh, all of these uh, 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 sort of new technologies in the electricity area including solar and wind, uh, would benefit very strongly from breakthroughs in battery technology, and a lot of work is being done on that. Uh, I said I would try to do this fairly quickly. Um, I think I've stayed within, I think I stayed well within my, my time frame. Uh, actually, uh, what uh, uh, Chairman uh, Bay and I uh, and Bill uh, thought was that if we could get through the, the initial parts, uh, that we really would like to um, hear what your questions are and address those. So. Uh, Bill, back to you, or or just over to uh, to Norm. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank the University of Montana and the Mansfield Center uh, for putting together. Uh, really such an outstanding uh, conference uh, that examines energy issues from so many different perspectives. I really think that um, Dr. Kim deserves kudos for putting this together. I've organized conferences myself in the past, and I have a sense for how difficult it is um, you know, to put together one of these conferences. And here, of course, uh, the Mansfield Center has brought in speakers from all over the world. And I also appreciate the very warm welcome uh, that the University of Montana in the Mansfield Center um, have provided uh, to us. We received a very warm Montana welcome. So what I'd like to do today um, is to present to you an overview of the U.S. energy markets. And to some extent, there's a little bit of overlap uh, between what Adam presented and what I presented, but that's because of the interrelationships between the U.S. energy markets and the global markets. Um, first, I have to give you my standard FERC disclaimer um, that basically what I'm saying doesn't represent the views of the Commission or the United States government. Uh, this represents um, my personal views. And believe it or not, um, even though I recently became the chairman, I still have to give that sort of disclaimer. But maybe not such a bad thing. It gives our agency plausible deniability, right? Um, so um, what I'd like to do today um, is to do an overview of the oil, natural gas, and electricity markets, and then talk about some of the significant trends and developments that are occurring in the United States, and discuss some of the challenges as well. Um, I also have a special bonus feature in here where I've got a few slides on Montana, okay? Um, so, um, as Adam noted, um, there really has been this amazing uh, uptick, surge really, in the production of oil um, in the United States. If you go back to 2005, um, you can see that uh, the United States was producing about five million barrels of oil a day. Um, you, you fast forward um, to the present, and it's about nine million barrels a day. So just this huge increase where in 2014, the United States once again became the, United, the, the leading oil producer in the world, um, a, a position that at last occupied perhaps in the early 1970s. So there's been this very dramatic development um, in um, the U.S. oil production. And, and most of that gain is due to the ability to use fracking technology 
um, in um, shale uh, and uh, tight uh, sandstone formations. Um, so um, it wasn't so long ago, uh, for those of us who follow um, the, the energy space, that there was a book uh, that described this theory of peak oil that the United States um, and other countries were running out of oil and it was destined to continue to skyrocket in price. Um, and so it's really quite a paradigm shift when you look at what's actually happening now. Um, so, um, of course, uh, the increased production has had an impact on price, and Adam touched on this as well. Um, if you look at the price for West Texas crude, you can see um, that in the summer of 2008, it peaks at about $140 a barrel. I can actually remember that time period because I was so um, almost uh, surprised that gas broke $4 a gallon in New Mexico, where I was at the time. Um, and then you can see how the price um, drops, right? Um, but then really for the next few years, um, it seemed to be that the norm was that oil was priced at about $100 a barrel. Um, and then, um, beginning in the summer of 2014, there's the big drop, okay? Um, and ultimately, in January of 2015, just a few months ago, um, West Texas crude um, breaks the $50 barrier, right? It's selling for under $50 a barrel. Um, today, if you check the NYMEX, um, for the June futures contract, uh, West Texas crude is trading at about $56 a barrel. Um, and again, this is um, not, um, a, as Adam noted in his presentation as well, this line here uh, that tries to plot out future prices is not based on a government projection. Rather, it is based on the price of futures contracts um, in NYMEX. So it's telling you what traders are thinking will happen to the price of oil over the next five years. And essentially, um, it goes up slowly and is somewhere between 70, uh, 60 and $70 um, a barrel. Um, because I uh, am from FERC, uh, we have a lot of authority over infrastructure, interstate infrastructure. We don't actually have authority over the price or production of oil. We do have authority over interstate oil pipelines. And so that's part of the story here. Um, and this, this next slide shows you um, the, basically the network of, of oil pipelines um, and uh, petroleum product pipelines in the United States. Um, not surprisingly, in a lot of respects, uh, the pipeline uh, network reflects historical production patterns. So you've got a lot going on in Oklahoma, Texas, Gulf area, and then um, pipelines going out to the East Coast, to the Midwest, um, and to the West, okay? Um, the thing that's shifting now is that with production in the Bakken, um, and in other areas, um, you're getting some development of um, pipe uh, infrastructure there as well. Okay, um, so the big story um, on oil, uh, the use of unconventional drilling techniques that have allowed uh, oil producers to uh, produce oil from formations where it was not recoverable in the past. Um, same story on the natural gas side. Um, if you look at uh, natural gas production, um, you can see how um, back in 2005, uh, the United States was producing about 16 um, TCF a day, um, trillion cubic feet per day. Um, you, you now look at, uh, say, um, this period here um, in 2012, um, and you can see that the production um, has uh, jumped to about 24 CF a day, TCF a day. Um, so basically there's been a 50% um, increase in production. And you can see that from this uh, projection, uh, and this is from the EIA, um, it continues to grow um, all the way out through uh, 2040. Now, uh, the one thing I want to focus you on is this period in 2008-2009. So you can see how right about then, um, the use of fracking technology is taking off, and this kind of blue delta here represents the increase in production, okay? Um, and I point that out because later on, I'm going to connect it back to 
um, what happens on the electric generation side, okay? So just remember that from 2008 to 2009, you get this increase in the production of natural gas. Okay, now let's talk about uh, prices. Um, and this is a, a slide very similar to the one that Adam had, um, where um, there was actually a time when in the uh, power sector, um, natural gas was not considered a particularly desirable fuel. And the reason for that was there was the concern that the supplies of natural gas were too uncertain and that the price for natural gas would be too volatile, okay? Um, and um, you can see how beginning um, in this period here from 2008 to 2009, there's this big drop in price. Um, and then um, basically at, at this point in 2012, it goes to about $2 per mm BTU. Um, and uh, so there's a slight uptick here. Um, and now uh, projecting forward based on futures prices, right? So this is the market traders trying to predict what the price will be going forward at one of the most important gas trading hubs. It's known as Henry Hub. Um, the price um, is somewhere between three to four dollars, okay, for the next few years. So there's this big surge in production, um, and then there's this impact on prices where prices suddenly, uh, at least according to the market, will, will remain um, at, at a very low range by historical standards, okay? Um, so now let's look at some of the gas infrastructure in the United States. The United States actually has this very robust network of interstate gas pipelines. Um, oh. um, and the thing I like about this slide is um, that it shows um, how a lot of the infrastructure is concentrated, again, in the Gulf states and in other production areas in the Oklahoma. Um, and then you get all these kind of blue veins, which represent the interstate pipeline shipping gas around the country. Uh, and a lot of this network developed in the 50s and 60s, so it reflects historical flow patterns from the production areas um, to the big load centers, the parts of the United States that needed the gas. Uh, whether it was for uh, electricity, home heating, or industrial purposes, okay? And so you can see, um, you know, this concentration here, and then these pipelines delivering gas to the big load centers in the United States. Um, the thing I like about this particular slide is superimposed on the map are these shaded areas that represent um, the shale formations um, that are now um, uh, you know, where gas is now being produced. So here you have the Marcellus Shale, this is the Utica, um, and of course this is the Bakken up here. Um, uh, so, um, and this is um, uh, the Barnett in Texas. But you can see how um, the production in those areas um, has, in a sense, um, been facilitated by the existence of an interstate gas network, and that additional development is occurring there as producers are trying to bring uh, their gas or, or other um, production um, to the market. So here's just another slide without the shale formations indicated uh, that indicates uh, the interstate uh, and intrastate natural gas pipelines um, in the United States. Uh, there is another dimension to all of this. So I've talked about some of the production. I've talked about the interstate pipelines. Um, there are markets, of course, where physical gas um, is traded, where it's bought and sold. So this would show you some of the major North American trading hubs uh, for natural gas. Um, maybe the most famous is Henry Hub. A lot of these other hubs are located, not surprisingly, outside of major cities. Uh, for example, Algonquin City Gate, that would be Boston. Transco Zone 6, New York, that's New York City. Um, Chicago City Gate, obviously that would be Chicago. Uh, PG&E City Gate, San Francisco. Um, so that's part of the story regarding the gas markets, that not only do you have to have the production, but then you have to have these trading hubs where gas is being bought and sold. And I'll talk about the markets uh, for um, 
electricity um, and natural gas a little bit more in, in just a few minutes. Um, so now let's look to see what, hap what has been happening with um, electric generation, and this is something uh, that Adam uh, discussed as well. Um, in some respects, this chart looks very unremarkable when you first look at it. Um, but um, as you may recall, in this period from 2008 to 2009, um, there was the beginning of this period where natural gas production was starting to ramp up, right? Remember that? So production was increasing, price was going down. Um, why does that matter? Um, if you look at the production of electricity in the United States from this period, from about 2001 through, th through 2008 or so, and really if you go back in time, the story would be the same. Um, most electricity in the United States was produced using coal, okay? So throughout that period in the early 2000 to 2008 time period, about half of the electricity in the United States was produced um, using coal. Okay, um, now let's look at what happens in 2009. You've got all that um, pretty inexpensive gas coming on the market. You see how it's pretty much about 50%? 2009, there's a big drop, okay? Um, uh, the share of electricity generated from coal drops from about 50% uh, to 45%. Um, uh, uh, why uh, is that significant? Well, among other reasons, um, natural gas produces about half the carbon of, um, of coal. Um, so, um, so what happens uh, over time, as you can tell from about 2009 forward, is the share of generation produced by natural gas continues to increase um, and the amount of electricity produced by coal starts to decrease. And this is um, largely through the operation of market forces, okay? Um, the other big development here, it, as you look at this, is the growth in renewables. I mean, it's, it's virtually negligible if you go to the early part of, uh, of the, um, of the you know, 2001, 2002 time period. Um, but then it begins um, to grow. And um, until ultimately, it's about uh, 7%, right, by 2014. Um, the share of electricity produced by nuclear is relatively constant over time. It's about 19 uh, to 20%. Hydro is relatively constant, it's about 6 or 7 percent, which means that currently in the United States about one-third of the electricity is produced through means that produce um, no carbon, um, and that an increasing amount of electricity is being produced using natural gas. Uh, in 2014, about 27 percent of the electricity in the United States was produced um, using, uh, using natural gas. Um, so let's now take a more detailed uh, dive into um, the growth of, of the use of renewables. Um, and you can see um, that it's fairly dramatic. Um, in 2004, renewables account for about 2% of the electricity in the United States. Uh, by 2014, it is more than tripled. You're, you're looking now at a decade later, you're looking at about um, 7%. Um, where are the big growth areas with respect to the growth of renewables? Um, it is um, in wind, right here, the blue bar, and you can see for yourself how that's growing over time, um, and it's also solar. So solar continues to make this kind of big leap um, over the last few years. Okay, um, so what are some of the factors that explain the growth um, in the use of renewables? I think there are a few factors here. Um, one of them surely um, is cost, okay? Um, what this uh, diagram uh, does is to show you that over five years, the percentage decrease um, in the price of wind has been almost 60%. Um, and so you get this big growth um, in the amount of wind capacity um, over time. Um, so that from 2001, uh, wind is responsible for a few thousand megawatts of generation. 
By 2014, um, it is close uh, to 70,000 uh, megawatts. So there's just this huge, huge um, increase. Um, where is a lot of this growth occurring? Um, you might be surprised when you see this next graph because people tend to associate wind um, with, I think, certain states where certainly there is wind, um, but not perhaps um, in the quantities that people might think. Um, rather, um, the number one wind-producing state is Texas, a state that most people associate with the oil and gas business. Um, California um, is uh, two, um, and so on down the list. Um, Interestingly, uh, Montana um, is not reflected on this chart, but as I will show you, among the states in the United States, it is the third richest um, in wind resources. Um, but I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, this chart shows you um, the average uh, growth rate over time. Basically, it's 30% um, average uh, growth rate. Now let's look at solar um, generation. And here I'm talking about photovoltaic as opposed to thermal uh, solar. Um, uh, this gives you, again, the same kind of story um, where uh, the cost of um, PV has continued to drop over time. Over the last five years, it's been greater than a 50 percent drop, uh, as, as reflected here. Um, in fact, uh, an analyst for Deutsche Bank um, uh, predicted uh, that in many parts of the United States, uh, solar would be cost competitive with other forms of generation at the retail level. Um, so, so as these costs continue to drop, um, I think one can expect to see um, more, uh, more solar, particularly uh, rooftop solar. Um, uh, but um, it's not so clear on this, but, but not only rooftop solar, but even utility scale solar. Um, Oh, actually, this is the diagram I mean, I'm sorry. This is, uh, this is the one that shows the growth of uh, utility-scale solar, this blue here. Um, and this kind of tan line up here, uh, no, that's concentrating, but this is the red, I'm sorry, the residential is, let's see, residential here. Um, oh, yes, it's, it's the red bar, yeah. non-residential PV. But, um, you do get a sense then for the growth of um, solar's, uh, solar's rapid growth. Um, there's one other development um, that is, I think, pretty significant that Adam mentioned. Um, and, that, uh, and that's what's happening uh, to um, the demand uh, for electricity, what's known as load growth. Um, this next diagram um, basically shows that um, there is about a 1%, a little bit under 1%, average annual increase in the amount of electricity. When you think about it, that's actually kind of an amazing figure. Why? Because um, this country continues um, to grow in size in terms of the number of people um, who live in the United States, but also because we are probably more connected um, into the grid than we have been ever before in terms of the amount of electricity we need. You know, you think of large screen TVs or cell phones or iPads or tablets or whatever it is. I mean, uh, people need electricity. You, you, you know, one cannot conceive of modern life in the 21st century uh, without having reliable electricity, right? Um, and in spite of that demand for electricity, um, overall, there's only this 1% average annual growth rate. Um, Adam had a slide that's very similar to this slide. Um, the last slide didn't look that impressive until you put it in a historical context. You know, if you go back to the 1960s or so, um, pretty much year over year, there was like a 6 to 8% increase in the amount of electricity demand from one year to the next. Now you compare it to what's happening um, from essentially 2012 on, and you can see how load growth um, has essentially um, stagnated. Um, it's increasing, but at a very, very low rate, okay? Um, you know, why might that be? I think there are a number of reasons there. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, an Energy Star program, right? Uh, whether it's TVs, refrigerators, dishwashers, other major appliances, 
um, they're more energy efficient. Um, then you have utilities that are administering programs um, that are designed uh, to promote energy efficiency. Um, and here, of course, you can see um, in 2012 um, just how extensive uh, the energy savings are um, in terms of uh, thousands of gigawatts. A gigawatt is a thousand megawatts. Okay, so what else is driving the growth of renewables? Um, part of the story um, is um, tax credits, whether at the state or federal level, but another big driver is um, renewable portfolio standards. Uh, 29 states and two territories have renewable portfolio standards that require their utilities to produce a certain amount of energy using re renewable resources. Montana has um, a renewable uh, portfolio um, standard uh, where it's 15% uh, by 2015. Um, California um, has uh, maybe the most uh, aggressive standard, uh, requiring 33% of their electricity to be, to be produced uh, from renewables uh, by 2020. Um, in addition to the states that have these renewable portfolio standards, these requirements, um, there are nine states and two, ter two territories that have renewable portfolio goals. So they're trying to encourage the use of more renewable energy. Um, a few other um, slides on, um, on the US energy markets. Um, and this is a slide that I think most people are completely unaware of. That is that in big chunks of the United States, there are um, transmission uh, or there are grid operators um, who basically manage uh, the transmission of electricity, but who also operate electricity markets. And um, uh, there are uh, seven ISOs, RTOs in the United States. Uh, there's ISO New England. There's the New York ISO. ISO simply stands for um, Independent Systems Operator. Um, this, this kind of turquoise color here is an RTO, a regional transmission organization known as PJM, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. Um, this kind of bluish color here um, uh, represents MISO, uh, the uh, mid-continent independent system operator. Interestingly, the eastern part of Montana is part of, of, of MISO, um, and it's probably part of MISO because that line would reflect um, the eastern interconnect. Um, this area here is SPP, the Southwestern Power Pool. This area here is ERCOT, uh, the, um, the, the market in Texas. And then this would be uh, CAISO, the California ISO. Uh, there is one other wrinkle I should mention to you regarding the U.S. energy market so you have an understanding of just how complex they are. So I've talked about infrastructure. I've talked about um, the production of energy. Um, and, and that's physical energy, right? Like actually buying and selling natural gas or electricity or oil. There's another dimension to it that I've alluded to, and that is the financial market for energy, right? The futures market, the swaps market. Um, and those markets also exist. Uh, and this would be an example of um, the, uh, uh, the Intercontinental Exchange, which is a pretty prominent exchange for uh, the use of, of the, of the uh, buying and selling of energy products, both physical and financial. Um, and what this, uh, what this uh, diagram shows you, as well as the next one, um, is that um, by dollar volume, or even by the number of transactions, um, the physical market for energy is actually much smaller than the financial market for energy. That is, there are many more swaps by dollar volume than there are uh, physical assets that are being bought and sold, which poses its own interesting um, oversight issues uh, for FERC and, and other agencies. But that's certainly something that we spend a lot of time thinking about and monitoring. OK, so what are the big trends and developments? Um, if you talk to anyone in industry, if you talk to other regulators, they will tell you that this is a time of great change. A lot is happening um, in the energy space. Um, you've got the shale revolution with fracking um, having turned out to be a disruptive form of technology. 
Um, there is the growth of renewables in distributed generation. You can think of distributed generation, uh, or a classic example of it, as being rooftop solar. Um, there is the development of um, public policy at both the state and, and federal level uh, that uh, deals with um, environmental issues. Um, and then there's load, load growth and increased energy efficiency. So with respect to the shale revolution, uh, what are you seeing? Um, an abundance of natural gas, um, low prices, um, an increased demand uh, for gas and the use of gas-fired generation. Um, changes to traditional flow patterns. It used to be that gas would flow from western areas uh, to eastern areas. Um, and, and now that's being reversed because of the development of the Marcellus and Utica shale formations. Gas is actually flowing from the east um, to the west. Um, this has prompted uh, the build out of new infrastructure. Um, and the U.S., as Adam mentioned, um, is uh, soon uh, to become um, an increasingly important gas exporter. Um, so even a decade ago, um, industry uh, was building LNG import facilities. Uh, the thought was that the United States was running out of natural gas um, and that these import facilities would be needed to take gas into the United States um, to serve uh, consumers in the United States. Um, and, but of course, with the development of the shale revolution, uh, those export facilities basically um, gathered a lot of dust. Um, and so what has happened is that um, the people who own those facilities, the companies that own those facilities, are seeking to convert them from import facilities um, to export facilities. Okay, in terms of increased renewables and distributed generation, um, there can be reliability challenges, uh, but there can also be benefits. Um, and um, certainly once you create um, or want to develop uh, renewables, oftentimes you need more uh, transmission. You've got a facility, maybe it's a wind facility, uh, that is producing power. How do you get it to the load center? How do you get it uh, to the cities uh, where the power is needed? Um, this can also create some scheduling issues in terms of transmission scheduling. Um, and with respect to distributed generation, the rooftop solar uh, units, uh, that can create a lot of issues um, at the state level uh, that uh, FERC uh, uh, does not deal with since we deal with uh, the wholesale of uh, the interstate markets, not the retail markets. Um, with respect to environmental rules, um, a lot is happening. Um, there are, are state laws such as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initi Initiative in New England. California has a cap and trade program. And then of course, as I mentioned, a lot of states have renewable portfolio standards or renewable portfolio goals. Um, there have also been uh, a series of EPA rulemakings, um, including the regional Hayes rule, um, a rule known as CASPER, MATS, and of course the latest EPA rule is um, known as 111D, the proposed clean power plan, which um, um, is trying to reduce carbon emissions by 30% from a 2005 baseline uh, period. Uh, the EPA uh, proposal has four building blocks, uh, which include um, increasing the efficiency of coal-fired generators, um, dispatching gas generation more frequently up to 70% rate, increasing the use of renewables, um, and then finally energy efficiency. Uh, with respect to the um, low load growth um, and energy efficiency, obviously there can be environmental and economic benefits, uh, but at the local level, certainly it can put more financial pressure on the local utilities, what I, I've called here load-serving entities. Uh, typically energy efficiency is a state issue, uh, but it is um, one of the building blocks that the EPA has uh, discussed in its proposed clean power plan. Um, and if you talk to most uh, people, um, they will say that energy efficiency may be um, low-hanging fruit, uh, that there are still further gains uh, that can be made, uh, whether it's through building codes um, or uh, the use of smart meters and demand-side management. Um, the one thing I would note is, as an example of energy efficiency, and the governor alluded to this in his remarks, uh, about 12% of the electricity in the United States is used for lighting. 
Um, if you go to um, a Costco now, you can get an LED bulb that uses a fraction of the electricity of a conventional bulb, and, and the price of those bulbs is getting cheaper and cheaper. Okay, so let me take a very quick dive into Montana's energy resources. I know I have one minute. Um, and so um, Montana obviously has um, a lot of oil and gas, it has a lot of coal, um, and it has a lot of hydro. Um, but um, as I mentioned earlier, it has a tremendous amount of wind. Um, and um, Montana is the third uh, what uh, most uh, uh, wind-rich state um, uh, in the United States. Uh, those of you who are from Montana, I'm sure, are aware of this. Um, but uh, if you get that purple band or the dark red, uh, that's considered um, kind of the most wind rich. But look how much purple there is here, right? Um, and um, it is estimated um, that uh, Montana has the wind resources uh, that, um, let me give you the figure, it's really kind of staggering. Uh, yes, NREL, uh, the National Renewables um, Energy Lab, uh, estimates that the wind potential in Montana is at 944,000 megawatts, okay? That would be like 944 really large nuclear reactors, okay? Uh, Montana presently has about 660 megawatts of wind production with an additional 200 that are going to be added. Montana is actually a net exporter of, of electricity. About half of the electricity produced in Montana is shipped to other states. Um, so what would be um, the problem, though, with trying to develop more wind? Um, and the answer is going to be transmission. How do you get electricity produced in Montana, um, out of Montana, to the load centers, whether to the east or to the west, where that electricity can be used? Um, there are a few big power lines um, in Montana, uh, but you would clearly need more if you wanted to develop a lot of wind, uh, and, you know, given the resources that are here. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, that's all I've got to say, and we'll take the, the questions. We're going to uh, start with uh, some questions from the audience here. And uh, first of all, though, while I sort through uh, some of these, let me ask both of you to do a little bit deeper dive on natural gas. Both of you mentioned it in different ways. Um, Adam, you mentioned the uh, huge resource base and uh, the possibility of uh, significant, perhaps, gas exports. If you could comment on what that might mean to prices domestically or what price effects it could have for customers. And Norman, if you could also think about on this gas front, um, what might keep you up at night making sure that when we're putting so much more gas into electricity, the gas is where we need it when we need it. So, Adam? Bill? We'll have to give, this. give it a second to warm up. There we go. <laughs> uh, EIA has actually looked at the impact of natural gas uh, exports uh, on domestic prices and production, and the conclusion that we uh, came to was that uh, allowing up to 20 billion cubic feet per day, which we think is highly unlikely to happen, but uh, is kind of at the upper end of the range of um, applications that have gone into the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, that uh, wellhead prices would, would go up, uh, but probably uh, less than 5%. And um, at the retail uh, and commercial levels, uh, numbers could be even lower than that. The, uh, you know, it's, it, given different circumstances, uh, and it depends on what you assume about the resource base, uh, the numbers could be, you know, we had, one, we had one finding that said a possible 10% increase, so that would be 50 cents on a base of $5. Currently, uh, gas prices are below three, so we're trading around three. So the, the answer there is the impact would be moderate. Um, although you didn't ask the question uh, in, a, in a very brief way, 
We also looked at the impact on wellhead prices of allowing uh, crude oil exports, and the conclusion we came to there uh, was that uh, it would uh, probably lower the price of crude oil and lower the price of gasoline because additional crude oil on the global markets uh, would result in, in uh, lower world oil prices and U.S. gasoline prices are tied uh, more to the global market than they are uh, U.S. regional markets. So um, if you allow uh, increasing exports of natural gas, you got a little bit of an impact uh, on prices, probably not enough to make a meaningful difference to utilities and industrial users. And, um, and you might actually lower gasoline prices if you allowed crude oil exports. is a very important question, uh, Bill. It's certainly one that FERC has been thinking about for the last few years as we recognize that there was shift um, um, to, uh, you know, from coal to natural gas. Um, so how do you make sure that there um, is fuel assurance, that generators that need natural gas uh, can get natural gas? FERC has done I think three different things here. One is to make clear when pipelines can communicate with generators or with the grid operators, the RTOs, ISOs that I mentioned in my remarks. Um, a second, and that's particularly important, by the way, uh, during peak load conditions, that is when the system needs a lot of electricity. Maybe it's a very cold day or maybe it's a very, very hot day. Um, a second thing that FERC has done is to try to improve the scheduling between the gas industry and the electric industry um, so that there are more opportunities, there's like an additional opportunity uh, during the intraday nomination cycle for a generator uh, to get uh, uh, basically um, uh, capacity on a pipeline in order uh, to ship gas. Um, and along those lines, um, uh, FERC did a rulemaking uh, that essentially tries to give electric generators the opportunity to know what their award is uh, from the RTO ISO before they have to try to get capacity on a gas pipeline. So scheduling practices, I think, are a big part of it. Um, and then, of course, there is the build out of infrastructure when that infrastructure um, is needed and is in the public interest. The final thing I would say that FERC has been trying to do is to encourage a market-based solution uh, that allows generators to, to achieve some degree or high degree of fuel assurance uh, so that they know that they can get gas uh, when they need it. For both of you, we've had a number of questions and we won't be able to get to all of them, but they do have to do with, uh, again, more about the renewables questions. Adam, you mentioned the trend lines, the growth. Uh, both of you mentioned the growth in renewables. Uh, however, in your slides, even though we go from um, uh, about 13 percent to nearly 20 percent in the electricity sector. Overall, renewables go from about 8 percent to 10 percent of all energy use in the U.S. by 2040. Can you comment briefly on what factors might change the actual percentage of overall renewables use we could have? Well, one would be policy regarding coal. So we'll see where that goes. That uh, would obviously uh, have an impact uh, here in uh, Montana, given that the uh, state is uh, one of the uh, largest of the coal producing states, actually. The um, other thing that's uh, really hard for EIA to capture in our economic models is uh, shifts in technology and breakthroughs in technology. And we've seen uh, a lot of progress, for example, made in the costs associated with wind. Wind is getting to the point where it's not, uh, it may not even need the federal tax subsidies that are associated with it anymore. And in fact, uh, in our, because uh, our reference case assumes existing law and regulation, and because under existing law, the subsidies uh, for both solar and wind expire, uh, we have growth in wind even without uh, the, the subsidies. If uh, we were to see a continuation of subsidies in the solar area or if we were to have a breakthrough in the costs associated with solar, uh, we could uh, see those numbers growing uh, from that level. 
Uh, one other thing that was not in this year's annual energy outlook, but we'll probably revisit it in the 2016 version of the AEO, is a, um, a, a carbon fee case. Uh, we have uh, looked at the past at the possibility of uh, policymakers deciding to uh, have a fee on carbon dioxide or carbon content of fuels. And uh, in looking at that, um, the uh, biggest impact that that has, Bill, is uh, uh, significant uh, growth in, more growth in uh, both renewables and, uh, and uh, natural gas in the short term and nuclear uh, produced electricity in the, in the long run. And Mr. Chairman, um, uh, there's a question about how we're doing in terms of integrating the intermittent renewables into the grid, and are you uh, confident that we're making enough progress there? So that, that has also been uh, something that FERC has been focusing on for the last few years, and FERC has done a number of things uh, to try to ensure that all resources uh, can uh, connect to the grid. Um, among the, the uh, measures uh, that FERC has put in place, um, there's one that allows for 15-minute uh, scheduling of transmission, which can be very important uh, for variable resources. We've tried to streamline the interconnection, interconnection queue process uh, for new resources. Um, and we've also promoted the development of certain kinds of products that, that can be used to ensure um, that uh, the system remains uh, balanced and reliable uh, when, um, when renewables are coming online. We've had a couple of questions having to do with geothermal energy, um, one of which is, why don't we ever mention uh, geothermal? Does it, is it too small to show up, I guess, on the, uh, on the charts? And could either of you address, just make a comment about geothermal and what you see? Okay. Uh, I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's small. Um, there are significant geothermal resources uh, in the western part of the U.S., uh, but they're not easy to develop. They actually take uh, quite a bit of capital investment. Uh, there are issues associated with it. Uh, it's been, it's, so it's not, um, it's not as inexpensive as you would think in, in the sense that the, the heat itself is, is free, but uh, you've got to do a lot of work to drill the wells. Uh, and deal with uh, the um, water issues, uh, the, the, the water and steam that uh, comes up uh, in many geothermal areas is difficult to handle. Uh, so we've uh, made a lot more progress in other uh, renewable energy uh, sources than we have with geothermal. We have some questions about climate change actions. Um, and the President's Clean Power Plan, both of you have mentioned that uh, policy can make a big difference in, in our energy mix. Um, Mr. Chairman, in view of the Clean Power Plan, of course, that probably uh, undoubtedly means uh, less coal-fired generation, more natural gas and renewable uh, generation. Um, the uh, EPA focused on that, but how about uh, the integration of your responsibilities on reliability and the EPA consideration, how are those being integrated? So I think that's a very important question. A FERC does not have um, authority uh, to promulgate environmental rules. Uh, so we are not an environmental regulator, uh, we're an economic regulator, um, and we also have uh, some authority over reliability um, with respect to the reliability of the, of the grid, the interstate transmission uh, system. Um, so uh, FERC has held four technical conferences uh, where we have uh, heard from a number of witnesses, including the EPA. They sent a, a very high-level person to each one of our technical conferences. And we've also heard from state officials. We've heard from uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, uh, we have heard from industry, uh, we've heard from many, many different stakeholders in order to try to get a better understanding of what the reliability uh, implications uh, might be uh, for the, uh, with respect to the proposed uh, uh, clean power plan. 
um, and I would expect FERC to remain engaged. I think it's very important for us to continue to have um, good communication uh, with EPA, uh, with DOE, uh, with the states, uh, with NERC, uh, with industry, um, and so I, I expect that conversation to continue, but, but for FERC to be engaged. We have a question about um, the uh, price of carbon, and has EIA analyzed the effect of factoring in carbon pricing, uh, the $37 a ton is mentioned as an example, um, and uh, can you say any more about the uh, price effects of uh, factoring in a price of carbon? Uh, well, EIA has not um, been involved in the calculating the social costs of carbon, which, uh, which often comes up. As I did say uh, earlier, we do have a side case where we look at um, what uh, the results would be for different fuels if the U.S. were to impose a uh, carbon fee of some type. Uh, and obviously, uh, you can uh, drive uh, the results of, of doing that depending on the size of the fee and how quickly it comes in. Uh, drives uh, coal consumption uh, down uh, because coal uh, among the fossil fuels has the highest carbon content and, uh, and then encourages uh, other fuels, and including nuclear, by the way, in our, our forecast because nuclear is the only uh, base load that is uh, that, uh, electricity in big ways that's carbon-free. Back to that uh, geothermal. Uh, geothermal would be carbon-free too. Uh, but it's less than a half a percent of U.S. electricity generation. One of the interesting things about uh, geothermal, and it does really get into this question of, of renewables and, and what's important in renewables, um, geothermal has the highest capacity factor. So once you do build a geothermal facility, it tends to run uh, a lot, and uh, that's useful uh, capacity factor of close to 70%, so it's on, online available 70% of the time. Uh, solar photovoltaic, for example, has capacity factors that are closer to 20, 25%. Um, you know, at nighttime it's not working, uh, if it's cloudy it's not as efficient, uh, and so on. So when you look at the range of of uh, renewable energy possibilities, uh, it's important to think uh, uh, about the issue of uh, when it's going to be available, and that's one of the reasons why battery technology uh, developments are so important, because the capacity factors uh, for things like solar and wind could be dramatically improved by breakthroughs in batteries. We've had uh, several questions about international implications, and perhaps this is a good way to move to our final couple of questions here. Um, but one of the questions is, do you see the uh, shale revolution uh, migrating to other parts of the world? And let, let me just hold that for a moment and go back to something that, uh, Commissioner, you focused on a lot, which was the infrastructure. Um, is there comparable infrastructure in other parts of the world that will allow the shale revolution even if the resources are there to fulfill its, its potential? And let me have both of you comment on that as our final pair of questions here. There are a lot, a lot of factors that would determine whether or not um, the developments uh, in um, drilling technology that have been used in the United States are used in other countries. Um, one would be the price of natural gas internationally and whether or not the, the economics uh, work out. Um, another would be whether or not in that country there is sufficient regulatory certainty uh, such that a company would be willing to make that big investment and, and make that bet. Um, and kind of tied to that would be whether or not um, a developer believes that there is a sufficiently strong rule of law. Um, another factor could be um, concerns over, over the environment. In some countries, uh, I've read, um, environmental groups have opposed uh, the development of, or the use of fracking. Um, and that has happened at the state level here in the United States as well. I think a final factor would be whether or not the infrastructure is there that could allow any gas that is developed uh, to be shipped uh, to the relevant market. Um, and that, that's actually one of the preconditions that not many people focus on in the United States, but, but 
in my view, was an important factor uh, for, for the development of uh, certain resources. Adam. Bill, let me just add to uh, Chairman Bay's uh, list uh, something that the governor mentioned, actually, in his opening remarks, and that is private property. Uh, one of the things that's really moved uh, the shale uh, drilling uh, much faster in the U.S. Uh, than, than might occur elsewhere. Uh, is the fact that landowners often own mineral rights uh, in the United States. That's uh, not often uh, true abroad. And uh, so um, farmers and ranchers uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, have uh, a financial incentive uh, to allow uh, hydraulic fracturing and drilling on their property, and, uh, and that makes it move a lot faster than it does in places like France, uh, where the state uh, owns the resources, and so the uh, the landowners get all of the headaches. They get the trucks. They get the uh, they get the drilling. They have the risks associated with spills. And it doesn't happen that often, but they get the risk, uh, but not a lot of the reward. And uh, by sharing out the risk and reward, as you do in Montana and as we do in uh, most of the other states, uh, it improves the um, it improves the public. Uh, willingness to, uh, to accept it. Well, thank you both for allowing us to get through so many uh, questions in rapid order here toward the end. And I want to thank you and I want our audience to join me in thanking you for being with us today and also thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. Thank you.